listening to Men of Harlech while looking at the mission station at Rourke's Drift, Natal. It should remind you of the Zulu War of 1879 and more generally should bring to mind images of empire. For the weapons expert, these things bring to mind visions of the infantry rifle of the 1860s through the 1880s, a black powder, single shot breech loader. Ideas for breech loaders existed long before the 1860s. This Ferguson breech loader of the 1770s was a flintlock, much as you've seen before. Its breech mechanism was that threaded column which you see attached to the trigger guard. After unscrewing the column, it was loaded with loose powder and ball, and the column was screwed back in. Though it held promise, it was beyond the capability of industry at the time. Further, its inventor, Major Ferguson, never got much opportunity to work on the design, for he was killed by the Patriots at the Battle of Kings Mountain. By 1859, the Sharps breech loader had appeared using the ordinary paper cartridge. Though a sturdy and robust design, the Sharps did not seal gas well. Used in the war between the states, it was not 100% satisfactory. All breech loading designs had drawbacks and none supplanted the muzzle loader. Put simply, the breech loader could not practically exist without the brass cartridge case. It is the cartridge case which holds all the elements. Powder, bullet, and primer in one neat package. Further, the cartridge case serves double duty by expanding against the chamber during discharge and sealing the gases in the barrel. This point is critical. The weapon holds the cartridge case and the case provides the seal. Brass cartridge cases had been experimented with immediately prior to the war between the states. During the war, a number of different breech loading and repeating designs were tried, each with a different cartridge case. Though many, like the Spencer, were used to some degree, the cartridge cases all suffered defects which limited the usefulness of the weapons involved. The cartridge cases were crude and non-uniform because the machinery of the day simply was not up to their manufacture. Further, they were normally rimfire, much as you see here. The rimfire is aptly named for the priming compound is distributed around the perimeter of the fold of the rim. In order to discharge the weapon, the firing pin had to crush the rim of the cartridge case. But if the cartridge case was made strong enough to withstand a large powder charge, then the firing pin couldn't crush the rim. Breech loaders had to wait on a decent metallic cartridge case with center fire priming. In the 1860s and 70s, a number of patents were awarded for center fire priming. Many of these, such as the Benet, Rodman, Milbank, Farrington, and others, were either used for a short period of time or did nothing more than contribute to other designs which would follow. Out of this flurry of activity, two designs emerge triumphant and carry forward to this day. They are the Boxer and the Burdan. Both of these primers were initially predicated upon the use of the designer's cartridge case. Boxer concentrated on the coiled brass cartridge case, as you see here. It was nothing more than brass foil wrapped around a mandrel and then soldered to a base washer with the primer inserted in the middle of the base washer. Burdan worked on the one-piece cartridge case made by the impact extrusion method. Further detail would serve no purpose. Suffice it to say that improvements in both center fire primers and cartridge cases occurred rapidly from the period 1866 to 1878 when designs seemed to stabilize. You can see the Burdan center fire primer on the left and the boxer on the right. Note the walls and base of the cartridge case are thick and strong to withstand heavy powder charges. 
The firing pin crushes the relatively soft primer cup against the anvil, and the flame thus produced from the priming compound travels through the flash hole and into the main powder charge. The firing pin supports the soft primer cup until the bullet exits the barrel and the pressure drops. The point is to remember that viable center fire cartridge systems were possible from 1866 onward. Throughout the 1860s and 70s, many different designs for breech loading cartridge firearms surfaced. The Sharps was quickly converted to center fire cartridge cases in 1866, and it is this which gave the Sharps its great popularity. Throughout the 1870s and 80s, it was the Sharps chambered for the large black powder cartridge cases, which was commonly used to harvest the buffalo for the meat and hide markets of the East. Many nations tried converting their muzzle-loading muskets to center fire cartridge breech loaders. The Allen system used in the United States will be covered in another tape. The Snyder system surfaced in England in 1862, and by 1866 had been perfected and adopted. In this conversion, the breech end of the rifled musket barrel was cut off and a trough-like receiver substituted. The breech block was nothing more than a cylinder of steel that rotated about an axis parallel to the axis of the bore. The cartridge was dropped into the trough pressed forward into the chamber, and the breech block pivoted into place. After firing, the breech block was pivoted out of position and pressed backwards, thereby extracting the cartridge case. Ejection was accomplished by picking the case out with the fingers or turning the weapon upside down. The Snyder was chambered for a 58 caliber center fire cartridge which basically duplicated the ballistics of the 58 caliber rifled musket. From 1869 to 1871, the British conducted testing for the adoption of a new breech loading rifle. Many competing designs were on the market. The Mauser turnbolt design was being perfected using the basic idea from the old needle gun. This was adopted in 1871 by the Germans. Remington had come up with their rolling block, a system which achieved some popularity in the United States and was adopted by a few nations abroad. What the British finally did adopt in 1871 was a modification of the American Peabody action. The improvements came from two men named Martini and Henry, thereby giving rise to the rifle's new name, the Martini Henry. In this weapon, a falling breech block is mounted on a rear pivot pin in the receiver. Upon moving the operating lever downwards, the nose of the breech block drops thereby exposing the chamber and extracting and ejecting any cartridge case that might be there. The shooter pressed the next cartridge into the chamber and closed the lever, thereby raising the breech block. We'll use two of these weapons in the range scene that you are about to see. The Snyder represents the lowest volume of fire and shortest combat range of the major breech loading systems, while the Martini Henry represents roughly the highest volume of fire and close to the maximum combat range.
The Snyder and the Martini Henry represented improvement over the 58 caliber rifled musket. The Snyder has the same range. The Martini Henry, with its higher velocity and better ballistic coefficient, has a greater battle sight and a just sight range. In both cases, the volume of fire is higher. The potential improvement is even greater. Both the Snyder and the Martini Henry must be manipulated by the soldier. The more dexterous and highly trained soldiers could easily increase the volume of fire of either weapon. Further, as range decreased and the need for attaining a precise sight picture consequently decreased, a soldier could spend less time in aiming and more time in loading, further increasing his volume of fire. Secondly, the combat range limitation on the 58 caliber rifled musket is due not only to its trajectory, but is also due to a fall off in accuracy as you saw in one of the previous tapes. At 350 yards, the rifled musket simply is not striking a human being sized target on every shot. Some of this same problem also existed with the Snyder. But by the 1870s, things had changed. Accuracy was undergoing a phenomenal improvement. Manufacturing tooling was being improved, and the weapons and ammunition were made with a precision unknown in the days of the rifled musket. All breech-loading weapons have a throat cut in the barrel between the chamber and the rifling. This is an area in which the bullet is eased out of the cartridge case and into the rifling. Because the bullet is precisely made to the groove diameter of the barrel, it travels through the throat and is engraved by the rifling with a shot-to-shot -shot uniformity that the rifled musket cannot hope to match. This means that the breech-loading rifle is far more accurate than any rifled musket. In fact, shot groups of one or two inches in diameter at 100 yards were not uncommon. Given our concept of the cone of fire, this would mean that these weapons could place every shot in a 10 to 12 inch diameter circle at five or 600 yards. This will fit on the chest of a human being, assuming that the sights are properly adjusted for the range. Combat range was now limited only by the trajectory of the weapon and range estimation error. Though the volume of fire was increasing, it was still not adequate to stop the frenzied mass charges of the dervishes or the Zulu unless the soldiers were in some sort of tight formation. Consequently, the line, the British Square, and other such formations stayed in the drill books throughout the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. Further, especially when the empire engaged some of the less industrialized peoples, the bayonet was still of some use. By the late 1880s, many developments in the way of repeating rifles, smokeless powder, and jacketed bullets were rendering these weapons obsolescent. Most would be replaced as frontline weapons by the 1890s. However, one should not assume that the weapons became instant junk. The Martini Henry was used by the Indian Army throughout World War I. In many areas of the world, these weapons are still held in inventory. As late as 1979, I saw Snyder rifles being carried by Egyptian soldiers guarding a bridge across the Nile. In 1978, I saw Martini Henry rifles being used in battle by guard force units in what was then Rhodesia. The period 1866 to 1890 speaks of empire and of fascinating weapons. Though its volume of fire was modest, the single shot black powder breech loader was highly effective. When properly employed, such as at Rourke's Drift, victory would normally result. 
when errors were made, such as those at Izan Shlawana, or when calculated risk went awry, such as with Alan Wilson's Shangani patrol, then nothing could really stem the tide. The preceding was a television presentation of the Audiovisual Instructional Technology Division, United States Military Academy.